it's just a huge honor for me today to bring back a friend of mine for probably three decades, Frank Milner, DDS, AACD, all the way from St. Paul, Minnesota. Frank is a graduate from the University of Minnesota School of Dentistry. He's an accredited member of the American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry and a board examiner for accreditation. Dr. Milnar maintains a full-time practice in St. Paul, Minnesota, emphasizing appearance-related dentistry. He has published numerous articles about the direct placement of composites, shade selection, and minimally invasive dentistry, is in a, and is on editorial review boards for numerous dental journals. Dr. Milnar is co-founder of the Minnesota Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry and has lectured extensively within the U.S., armed forces, as well as internationally on the subject of direct composite restorations, shade selection, and minimally invasive dentistry. He has been voted top dentist and voted into the Top Dentist Hall of Fame for the last six years by his peers in Minneapolis, St. Paul, Minnesota. He has been voted by Dentistry Today as one of the top 100 dentists contributing to dental education. Most recently, Dr. Milnar was nominated to the University of Minnesota School of Dentistry Continuing Education Advisory Board. Frank, it is just an honor to have you on the show today. How are you doing, buddy? Howard, I'm doing very well, and I'm quite humbled by that introduction. You know, I've only been a dentist for 41 years, coming up on 42, and I would have achieved all those things that you said sooner if it wasn't for one thing, and that was lack of talent. <laughs> I would say guys like you, my, my read on guys like you is just a, just a natural curiosity humble to learn new things you'll listen to other people and if you if you're naturally curious and you're humble and you hustle you can really learn a lot and dentistry can make a great profession for you wouldn't you say well it comes back to the title of this podcast howard i'll let you troll on me it's called the past left the path less traveled and i'll tell you where this curiosity and creativity came from and i'll tell you where it it, it didn't appear and that was through uh, dental school, because in dental school, nowhere was there any mention of creativity and artistry. It was all science left brain stuff. But uh, I'll let you start it out, Howard, and we'll, we'll loop back into this. And this is really kind of a cool story. Well, tell the story. OK, so just for the your viewers out there, for disclosure, I'm not the smartest guy in the room. OK, I'm creative. I find ways to get around the smart guys. Yeah, I came from the back of the room. I did not sit in the front row because I didn't want to be identified and embarrassed by who I was. However, I studied the guys in the front of the room and I saw what they did and how they learned. And I wanted to work my way from the back of the room to the front of the room. Okay, I was the guy that always made the last cut. I was the guy that just barely made it into the B's. I was the guy that just sneaked into an A once in a while, and I, I but very seldom could people outwork with it, outwork me because I have a very strong work ethic accompanied by creativity and of different ways to achieve what the smart guys do. Now. You tell me, Howard, in undergraduate school, 1967 through 1971, as a science major, like all of you took the biology, the chemistry, the physics, the calculus, the philosophy. How many people do you know, Howard, had a minor in English and art history? I would say none. You're the first one. I'm the first one. <laughs> I was the only guy in that whole science building that would hang out with the art students I would be the only guy writing English papers, and I hadn't a clue, but it just felt like a natural fit, okay? So, so be it. On to graduation, 1971, on to the University of Minnesota, 1972, welcome to the world of science, okay? Now, I bought into it. I had to, to get a degree, get my diploma, and get going. I started out... I did a GPR residency at the uh, VA hospital in Minneapolis. Oral surgery and pros were my two components, the two foundations that ruled dentistry back in the 70s back then. It was like totally overwhelmed prosthodontics and uh, my uh, head of the VA out there, Dr. Dave Toomey, was the king of removable pros at the University of Minnesota and I wanted to study under the master. 
Well, I hung out with the prosthodontists, and then I became a clinical instructor and removable pros right right out of the get go after the GPR. And then I bought into dentistry quadrant amalgams like you did, Howard. I mean, it was rock and roll and uh, tooth destruction, uh, quadrant amalgams, uh, gold crowns, you name it, we did it. Anterior composites just on the scene, uh, phosphoric acid. We didn't know what megapascals were. We didn't know anything about how many dentin tubes we were opening up. But the big thing I always remember about the practice management people that arrived in the 70s is was all about production. We were successful dentists if we could produce. How many crowns could you prep? What was your daily production? What was your daily production goal? How could you share that with the staff? How could you give them bonuses for your production? How could you make more money by destroying tooth structure? That was the bottom line, and I bought into it, Howard. I was really good, because I'm really competitive. And I destroyed a lot of teeth, and I made a hell of a lot of money. Now, here's the part. In 1993, I hit the wall. I went emotionless in the dentistry. I looked in the mirror and said, like Carly Simon, is that all there is? I had no clue what it had just happened to me. I had no passion. I couldn't look at myself in the, in, in the mirror and say, who am I? What am I going to do? Where am I going to go? And some one of my good friends who is a uh, Chuck Maragas from Valley Dental Arts in Stillwater said, Frank, you ought to come to the AACD. And I said, what's that? Well, it's American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry. And I said, what's that? He said, it's a fun place. All the leaders go, the Ron Jacksons, the Larry Rosenthal's, people like that, they teach you. He says, you got to try it on for size. I went down there in 1993, Howard, looking for something, a new message, a new vision. That was in Miami. And as soon as I walked into the door, I saw people having fun. I saw people going into class. I saw people socializing. And I saw people like Ron Jackson. I saw people like Larry Rosenthal. I saw them teaching and go and socializing with the people in the classes. And I said, that's it, I'm in. That's all it took. Now, I had a problem. I didn't know enough. So what I did is I reinvented myself in 1993. Everything I knew got destroyed. Everything I was in that office that I practiced dentistry, I told the staff, we're going to go on an amazing journey. I'm not sure how long it'll take, but you're going to see something different, the next version of me. Immediately, I went back and I called the professors at my undergraduate school at St. Paul, Minnesota, and I called them in the art history department, and I said, hey, guess what? I'm coming back. I'm going to be a student in art history. I want to go through the Renaissance again. I want to attack every single cause of, of ignorance that I could perceive that I had, and I wanted to seal the breach. So I went through a year of art history in undergrad school. I learned all about pointillism, cubism, Monet, all these artists uh, that had a major influence in color theories, color blending, the color wheels. And then I went into the dental laboratories at Valley Dental Arts and I said, here I am. I want to start at the bottom. I want to work in your, your model department, pouring up models. I want to die trim. I want to work from the ground up in the dental laboratories and learn what you do every day to create the work that I, that I take for granted. I did that one day a week for three years. And I evolved, Howard. I evolved from... I wasn't Dr. Milner there, I was Frank. Frank, could you pour up that model? Frank, could you do this? Can you get the call on some guy who said you die trimmed his model wrong? Well, it was a bogus impression. I just trying to make up margins like they did for me. And I had to, he didn't know I was a dentist. I was just Frank. It was interesting, Howard. I gained a lot of empathy for the dental technicians that, that where they got blamed for poor content they had to do that. Now, this is getting interesting. So I became accredited in three years from a guy from the back of the room to accreditation in the AACD in three years. 
that was the biggest mountain I climbed. I had no idea how I did it or did my family because I was totally consumed by this. But I was reinventing myself as I went along. I was in the I was a piece of clay. That's all I was trying to shape myself, figuring out how to do this the right way. I picked on some world class mentors to be nameless. I said, help. I just became accredited. I want to I want to learn how to teach. Because I saw these people with microphones, laser pointers, slide carousels, no less, some with three. I said, this is it. They have recognition. They have respect. They are learned people. They're willing to share. I said, that's what I want to do. They said, listen, Frank, you have any idea what, what you're going to need to do to do this? I said, well, I don't know. Let's let's go. What do you what do we want to do? And they said, first, you have to be a better clinician. Sure, you're accredited. That's just a start. That's number one. Number two, you have to be an educator. You have to be about to learn who you are before you learn who your audience is. You just can't talk to slides and and have speaker notes and from the manufacturers. That's bogus. That's unethical but it happens. Number three, you have to be a publish, publisher of your works. I said, how high is this mountain? They said, higher than you'll ever, get. you can imagine. I, how, I started that, Howard, that climb about 1997. 1999, I was asked by Larry Adelson from San Diego, head of examiner, ACD examiners to be a board examiner in 1999. After three years of being an accredited member, I have no reason why, I don't know any good reason why they picked me to be a board examiner. They saw something. Something was growing, Howard. And at that point, I was learning who I was and what I was meant to be and what how could I overcome the difficulties and the kind of the, the sins of the past in the 70s, in 80s, and teach people don't do this? It's not worth it. You're going to wind up like me. Your staff knows it. Your patients know it. And I said, I'm going to, this is going to be my message going forward. Sure, I can sell product. I can teach, show you artwork on the slides. I can show you complex bonding, smile design. I can show you a lot of really good artwork slides. But before we talk about that, let's talk about who you are. I'm going to tell you who I am. Who are you? What are you going to offer this profession that's, you know this, Howard, it's been the best to us, been very good better than anything I know if you get your head on screwed on straight and you get this figured out what this is all about at some day you're not going to be here I'm not going to be here and we're going to pass this on to the next generation unless we get to these kids that are coming on your online and get them connected with mature mentors I am a little bit worried about the future of dentistry and how corporate corporate dentists are going to come in and have a major influence on the quality of dental care. Now, that's started to evolve. Once I became authentic with integrity, once I became unique as an individual, and we'll talk about that, where did these, what, how did my personality develop? It came from a certain place before I went to dental school is where are we going to go? What are we going to do about this? And this is where you and I are in the legacy stage of our career, trying to make sense of this before our time is up. That's kind of the, that's kind of the story, Howard. But it all started once I could look in the mirror and find out where I was going doors started opening up for me. I know this wasn't by chance, that this had to get out, that there was toxicity in our profession. We can be seduced by 
pay by production. We can be seduced by lack of leadership. We can be seduced in so many ways of dentistry, but there's only one way to do it, and that's the right way. And that's what dentistry is all about, is doing it the right way for our patients, for the teeth, the dentist come third, Howard. That's a beautiful story. And it shows, you know, you practiced from, you graduated in 75, and you said you hit a wall at 93. It sounds like in 93, you were just starting to be dead inside about the profession. Yep. And, then, and then you found the AACD. And yeah. they, uh, others might have found the AGD or Spear or Kois or Panky or Dawson. But that's where these high dollar uh, institutes really give you a return on investment is when they're not, not teaching a clinical skill, but getting your head back into the game. And it sounds like the AACD was that and, and a bag of chips for you. It really inspired you. And that's the same thought I have about a lot of people think I'm against CAD cams and lasers and all that stuff. They're not listening to me. If, if, if that's what makes you run 20 red lights on the way to work, God dang, you got to get it. As opposed to what? Burn out, get tired, hate your job. But if you're just, but if you're broke with $350,000 student loans and you think you have to buy a CAD cam to be a great dentist, well, that I disagree with. Do you do agree with what I just said on CAD cam and laser? Do you think you can be a high quality dentist in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota without a CAD cam or a laser? Uh, you sure can. What's most important when these dentists say, Frank, what's what product do you use? What was that? What was that instrument that you touched that with? Um, what was that finisher and polisher I just saw on slide 50 in the handout or in the workshop? And I said, do you understand something? It's not those products. It's not that instrument. It's not that laser. It's your patients. You get to know them. You get to earn their trust and respect, and then you can apply, get the lasers and you can get all the other stuff to go with it. But unless you understand the trust and confidence and why they look at you as their dentist, the rest, it, it doesn't make any difference, Howard. It just doesn't. You know, one of the greatest things I learned at a, at a AACD course, I was actually lecturing at it in Jamaica like a gazillion years ago. Is uh, when you're talking about an instrument, I asked it first. I said, "Where did, what instrument was that?" He goes, "Dude, I don't know. I buy all my uh, direct composite stuff from Hobby Lobby. They have an uh, arts and craft stores." I came home and I went to Hobby Lobby and got all these spatulas and facials. I, I when, when I'm doing direct, uh, you know, uh, for on anterior teeth on pretty girls. Uh, have you ever bought any instruments uh, in the mouth that you didn't buy from a dental company? And it was intended for arts and crafts. <laughs> no, I did. Oh well, well, yeah, I did. My my uh, my my sculpting brushes. Yeah, I bought them from Dick Blick. You know, they had some kind of neat angled things. I did that, and um, I can say for the most part, I'm more artisan, which we'll get to. But I, yeah, I uh, I can take things offshore and you know incorporate them for the most part, but usually as a consultant for a lot of manufacturers, I'm kind of foundational in their instrumentation and coming up with new designs that uh, uh, fit the fit the need for what we're doing, the paradigm that we're, we're restoring. Well, to, to this day, if I had to do an anterior class uh, four or a direct anterior composite, there's uh, there's one instrument for, that I can only buy at Hobby Lobby that I have to <laughs> <laughs> but um so you um just two weeks ago you had gave what three lectures at the aacd meeting in las vegas what what were you uh and by the way congratulations only i mean that that's like the rock and roll hall of fame i mean you can't play at the rock and roll hall of fame you can't lecture at the aacd meeting unless you're all that and a bag of chips um what were you lecturing on well it's interesting howard this is my passion is in the workshops because this is where we get a real effect on a one-to-one -one relationship with the attendees. And one of the, one of the, one of the case, cases you have to submit to become accredited is six composite veneers. And you have to show the step-by-step -step to the examiners who we grade your work. And it's usually the, the final hurdle. Everybody passes the other court, the other uh, case types, and then they stumble on case type five because, as you know, six composite veneers that can be the baton death march 
and you can there's so many different uh, trip wires in there. So it's about seven years ago. I stumbled when I became accredited. I just my God, uh, probably 75 hours into a case and I was still not there. So I said, listen, I'm going to do this. I'm going to develop a case type five protocol with slides on a type on. And then my my laboratory accredited uh, technician, Jenny Wolberg from Valley Dental in Stillwater. I said, Jenny, we're going to teach this. OK, so. Jenny and I were the first ones to teach the case type five in the ACD. However, Howard, this gets better. As a board examiner of the ACD, I got to know who 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 is who is sitting in these boardrooms, but then you got to meet them personally. And I sought out Brian LeSage from Beverly Hills. And we had some small talk and I said, hey, Brian, let's teach case type five together with a lab tech credited lab tech, Jenny Wolberg. Let's be the first one. So we were the first ones to arrive at case type five in the ACD, three instructors, one, one lab tech and two accredited members. Well, as the story goes, that went on for two or three years. Now, Brian and I have been teaching probably for five years together. And our course is probably sold out in five minutes on an annual basis because of the content, Howard, and how we teach, teach the course. So that's one. Always look forward to that. 50 people in a classroom, two guys were gasping at the end of the day. It's grueling. The other one that I've introduced that I have a lot of passion in, I was curious, like you said, I was real curious in the 90s about pink composites. Not much there. How do you use it? There are no instructions. But I was used to this from the 70s, Howard. Heck, we just picked up stuff and figured it out how to use it. Well, I picked up some pink composites from Voco and GC America, everything. And I kind of just looked at them and said, wait a minute here. This is uh, anything goes. They just sell you a box and you're supposed to create these things on roots and things like that. I said, this doesn't make any sense. So three years ago, I consulted with Shofu, one of my sponsors, as with other many sponsors, and they became very interested in developing a pink composite in which they had the full array of finishers, polishers, burrs. So all I did was sequence the darn thing, uh, package it with burrs in a step-by-step -step video illustration in how to use pink composites. It's called the Trilogy of Pink. In fact, I just gave a all day pink composite workshop up here in Minnesota for the Minnesota Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry. The first part of the trilogy of pink is gingival recession, because if your patients don't want grafting procedures and they're scarred, they don't like these, uh, these exposed roots, what does the clinician do today, Howard? They put in beta composites, A2, A3, and what do you get? You get a big, long, white tooth. Doesn't look good. So, that the first part is how do you restore gingival recessions? Now, this is the artist in me and in the, as you say, the curious part. I also did the trilogy of this. I did one on a type of knot with no sulcus. I did the second tooth with a different color and a sulcus and no microtexture. The third one, which is the artistic design, is a different color with a how to create a sulcus and how to create micro texture to mimic the pink prosthetic area that you're restoring. That was the first part of the trilogy of pink. The second part of the trilogy of pink is closing dark triangles. And if you know Dave Clark up in Tacoma, Washington with BioClear, this is a guy that's really revved me up. I've taken his courses, I'll be teaching BioClear with David, for David, in the bioengineering way to do things that make sense and how to close, close dark triangles. Our profession does not know how to close dark triangles. With flat mylar, give me a break. You can't do it. You're gonna get purple inflammatory tissue versus pink healthy tissue. That's number two. The third part of the trilogy of pink is after you have dark triangle closure with white 
heated composite injection over molding is that you do a cut back where the pink prosthetic area is, and then you apply the lessons learned in component one in how to overlay the, the gingival portion of the dark triangle closure where there was gingival tissue. I mean, that, I just gave you a mouthful, Howard. That's a lot of stuff. Who was that guy you were talking about? Dave Clark, BioClear. He's a guy you want to talk to. BioClear, where is he at? Tacoma, Washington. And I'll tell you why. Can I, should I digress now, Howard? Well, first of all, I would never podcast a Seahawks fan. I mean, there's just certain, <laughs> there's just certain things I will not stoop. Well, but, okay. But, but I want you to digress. This is Dentistry Uncensored. Okay. This is, this is where it really gets cool for me because it's who I am. I worked undergrad school in dental school in heavy construction. Okay. I wasn't afraid of a shovel. I wasn't afraid of any of this hard work. Um, going up uh, 15 floors with no safety rails. I could look over the edge. I could do this kind of stuff. I didn't know, Howard, if I was getting into dental school in 1972. Why? My grades weren't there. Okay? I wasn't the first one to get accepted. And time was marching by. It was... uh, Right after school in May, no acceptance letter in dental school. So I'm thinking this. What happens if I don't get the acceptance letter in dental school? What am I going to do? I walked this one back a year before. I got my 49ers license. I was a tower crane operator. Okay. I was up in a tower crane. Wasn't that the Vietnam War too? Uh, that was, yeah, the Vietnam War was there uh, at that time, too. As you know, that was not a good time in in this country. But were you worried about getting drafted? No, my, dra- uh, my draft number was high, so I, I missed that one. What was your draft number? Oh, I forgot what it was. Was it a 200 number or something? Okay. It was high. Okay. So you became so anyways, a tower crane operator. Tower crane operator. So I, constru- I saw construction from um, straight on is a laborer. And then I was a concrete tester. Uh, when there was, I was around pile drivers, I was around steel workers, I was around carpenters, electricians, plumbers, I saw the whole thing. I saw the guys brooming slabs, I saw uh, flying slabs, pumping concrete. And then from an aerial view, I saw it from a different dimension, but I got the artisan part real good. I saw framing, I saw finishing, polishing, I saw how to finish things and cinch them and and seam them. I knew what grade level was. Okay, I knew what blueprints were. Okay, I could see the blueprints. Everybody had a blueprint. So when I got accepted, probably one of the last ones to get in, I climbed out of the tower crane for the last time, and I started my career as a dental student. Again, no artistry, no creativity, but a hell of a lot of artists and principles on construction. And I had to put that in the back of my mind because they didn't exist in dental school. When this thing came full, when, when this came out, Howard, and this art history thing, the construction principles came out with it. So today when people take my courses, we're talking about construction. We're talking about common principles of architecture, of building, of installing, uninstalling. All these things are true, not to dentistry, but to the artisans, artisan skills that would have been through with man for mankind long before dentistry arrived. So you're going to get a unique perspective of a common sense guy, hardworking, artistic, creative, with a construction background. I want I want to go back to something though. You you, you I, I asked you what you were lecturing on at the uh, AACD last couple of weeks ago in Las Vegas, their annual meeting. You said case site five, six direct composite veneers. You've been around. You've been in dentistry forty one years. I graduated from dental school thirty years ago yesterday on May eleven eighty seven. Um, tell these kids because a lot of people don't like to tell the truth, but tell these kids if you took a twenty one year old. And you filed down those six 
uh, anterior teeth, just a millimeter or so, and did six indirect porcelain veneers and cemented them versus doing six direct composite veneers on a 21-year-old girl. Let's say she's 20. What would happen to those teeth if you did an indirect porcelain veneer, you prepped the teeth? What would those six teeth look like from 20 to 30 or 40 or 50? Now she's 60. How many, at 60 years old, how many of those would have had to been redone? How many of them would turn to endo? How many of them would have turned to a full coverage crown? How many of them might have even the endo failed and been an implant in a crown? Lots more casualties of war than we care to admit, Howard. We went through the ACD in seduced by porcelain laminates, Hornbrook, all of them leading the pack, pack live. Uh, Dorfman, uh, you name it, they were all there. We all wanted these, these beautiful website photos of all the indirect veneers. Now, I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to answer your question straight on, Howard, is that in the AACD now, if, you, if we smell Denton on a, uh, a direct veneer, you fail. It's called responsible aesthetics. I don't think if nice. you and I... Nice. Responsible aesthetics. I have not heard that term. I always okay. considered it the aesthetic health compromise. No, no, no. If you and I started our own dental school right now, I would not let them put one porcelain laminate on an anterior tooth until they learn how to do reversible, repairable bonding, which is the ethical standard of our time. You cannot take an indirect procedure on a juvenile in 20, 21 years, unless they sign the contract that you disclose you're gonna lose some of these teeth. They will be lost every time you have irreversibility with these porcelain surfaces, albeit maybe more stain resistant, I don't know, but those things are gonna be taken off and when you take them off, you're drilling deeper into these teeth. Pretty soon you lose your foundation of, of your dentin support, the stress distribution mechanism of that whole tooth, the shock absorber that nature gave it in the first place is screwed. It's done, it's cooked. You have no out except drastic dentistry, which is what they should major in if they're gonna do that because you're gonna see train wrecks. But, you know, you and I saw the hypocrisy because I think we talked about this over more than a drink or two uh, decades ago is uh, um, they a lot of the guys doing all these force veneers when his 18 year old daughter had crooked teeth and wanted veneers. He said, no way you're doing ortho and bleaching and bonding. So did you did you smell that 10, 20 years ago where they kind of they knew in their gut this wasn't good because they had a different behavior for their wife and children than they did on their patients. Well, how true, Howard, we were practicing anecdotal dentistry. We, we, were, we were being pulled along by corporate America saying this is great, this is uh, this Targus Vectris, this is everything is so cool, it's gonna work, but we didn't know the part the, about the problems. We gave them the data about the failures that we had. Ergo, we get the new and improved this, and the new and improved based on what? Based on our failures. Okay, we didn't know anything about that. Now today, as you know, everything is evidence-based. You cannot do anecdotal dentistry without clinical references. And I may say too, in front of a patient, you have to understand, you have to disclose your competency about what you know about this. What are the risks going forward when you touch tooth structure? What are the risks? Doing nothing sometimes, Howard, is your best is your best option for the patient. I'll never forget. I'll never forget when I met the oldest dentist ever. His name was George Rui Sr. And his son, George Rui, the second one's a dentist. And his son, George Rui, the third was my roommate all through dental school. And I asked the 92-year-old George, I'll never forget. I said, which tooth lasts the longest? And he said, the one you never touch. Yeah. Treatment yeah. condemns it to retreatment. Fillings turn to crowns. Crowns turn to root canals. Root canals turn to yeah. extractions. We saw it all, Howard, in our time, we saw it all with these amalgams that we put in. And we saw what happened when we, we messed up the, the stress distribution and these cusps started snapping off. 
And then we started entombing these amalgams underneath and then the teeth died. And then you put reamers in the teeth and you open up the big access openings in these teeth and they broke off at the gum. And then you put a screw post in it or a gold post and then you screwed up the radicular uh, support of the tooth. And then there she goes. And then we grabbed the forceps and out it came partial dentures, and you knew how that worked. You put a clasp on the tooth, and that just headlocked it into submission, and then you kept on adding on and on until you got a full denture. Okay, Frank, I'm going to ask you a real – I'm going to hold your feet to fire this. I'm going to bring you down to real-world reality. You, you got you got lots of kids driving to work right now, and they're out in the middle of just, you know, the, the we, we were born and raised in the flyover states. And, uh, you know, they're driving to work at Shawnee, Missouri, uh, you know, uh, um, Edmonton, Oklahoma, Parsons, Kansas, and a cuss breaks off. And a lot of the AACD guys say, you know what, I just replace what's, you know, I take out the old filling, what's broken, maybe I'll bevel a cuss, and I just take an impression and do an inlay or an onlay or whatever. I just replace the missing tooth. But the reality, the cold, brutal, ugly truth. If she just takes out everything, shoes a functional cusp, it's, if it's in jeopardy, and submits an impression and does an onlay, insurance says no, no dice. But if she gets out her diamond and files that tooth down for a full coverage crown, they pay 50%. That's a brutal reality for at least 80% of American dentists. What would you say to that young girl? She's 30 years old listening to you on the way to work. What would you say to her? Hey, first of all, you have to pay your debt, Howard. I know this. I know that these young graduates are deep in debt. I, 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 I'm, I feel bad for them. That's a tough one to get out of. I can tell you where your future is right now, whether you work in a corporate uh, setting, whether you're just starting out in a small rural uh, environment, whether you're in a thriving practice, is things have turned. Before you amputate that two structure into 360 degrees of taper or ad adhesion that you can adhere the zirconia crown or whatever it is, you can scan it, you can do anything you want. Just remember this, the new emerging frontier in dentistry is bioactivity and therapeutic materials, glass ionomers, pulp dent, before you crown that darn tooth. You got to ask yourself the question, what is the survival rate in this 15% of all crown teeth need root canals, Howard? So how can you get around that one? What if you snap that tooth deep around the, the, the pulpal tissues or deep into the dentin or subgingival? Why not put a therapeutic buildup that is a dentin substitution such as glass ionomer uh, why not put a therapeutic material like Pulp Dense Activa in there and let the tooth heal first to determine the survival rate and then come back and harvest it later in the future? All you're building is integrity with the patient. Don't go to that crown right away. Don't do it. You're going to see it come back at you, and the patients are going to wonder why you put a, new, a big hole, a manhole cover in that brand new crown that you just put in a year ago. They get suspicious. You cannot lose Howard by doing something else as a option to the patient. You can't lose. So I want to ask you another hard pounding question. The guy with 41 years can brutally tell the truth. She wants to be a good dentist. Does she need to buy a hundred and fifty thousand dollar CAD cam to be a good dentist? She's got three hundred fifty thousand dollars of student loans, and she's in Parsons, Kansas. No. What you need to be is a good communicator. What you have to do is learn how where the risks are. And here's, a, here's another opening. What I do now, Howard, versus pick up the handpiece and look at the x-rays and tell 40 years ago, I would say, you need a crown, Howard. You need quadrant amalgams. You need this, you need that to based on, to fit my treatment plan, to fit my equipment, my production today. I look at risk assessment on all patients, how many 
restorations do they have in their mouth? How old are you? Well, how old were you when you got your first cavity? I checked the oral environment first with litmus paper to find out the pH of their saliva, to find out if they're moderately moderately acidic or high, highly acidic environment. I do not touch these people with anything but glass ionomer if they are in risk categories because your work is gonna be doomed. And if you walk into an hostile, non-friendly uh, eco and, uh, ecosystem in the mouth and you think you're gonna do uh, fun dentistry and crowns, they're going down. They're gonna go down in five years, Howard, and you're gonna have to tell the patients whose fault it was. It was you, you never established the risk. So today I'm telling all these graduates is understand the environment that you work in is full of biofilm. 3% are the bad guys. And if you let these guys loose with moderately acidic or acidic saliva, they're gonna take down 97% of the good community, the work's gonna fail. I think that should be a good starting place as a builder of the mouth before you get in there and take that hand piece and start removing tooth structure. Um, Frank, I want to ask you another uh, international question. Why do you think the Americans, what, what, I mean, the bottom line, seriously, you, you say you start off as a, as a, a tower crane operator. Yep. When you go to dental seminars, I mean, the, when, when they're talking about composites, like, the morning half, they're talking about all the different wear rates of all these composites. In the afternoons about all the bonding strengths and megapascals of bond strength. They're talking like mechanical engineers. But when that darn filling fails, nine times out of ten, it's not going to be because it wore all the way down and fell out. It's because bugs from the biofilm came and ate the whole thing out. And when you go to the AACD meeting, like I've gone several times, and you talk to dentists from Japan, Australia, New Zealand, they're into glass owners. They, they want a filling that that uh, combats bugs. And when you go to America, it's like a mechanical engineering and a tower crane operator and wear rates and bonding strengths. And we finally got one company, uh, Pulp Dent, that's trying to change the course saying, dude, you always talk about building a barn and you always talk about uh, your, your wooden barn. It's the patient's uh, responsibility to brush and clean it. But at the end of the day, it's always eaten by termites. So we, we kind of, do dentists need to kind of go from being more mechanical engineers to more the Terminex man who comes by my house every month and sprays down an active ingredient so that less ants and cockroaches. And by the way, Ryan, did you see the scorpion I killed yesterday? <laughs> my God, we're in Arizona. I killed a scorpion two feet. I didn't even have to get on my chair to stomp it. I mean, I mean, I'm, but anyway, do, do you get what I'm saying? I mean, the, the biofilm yeah, is the I issue. I do. Uh, is he Not be, where? But the dentists that are, they really are entranced by these restorations and, and the final restoration. I'm a perfectionist. Uh, I said, well, excuse me, wait a minute here. Whoa, what's the environment you're working in? Are you are you controlling the pathogens that cause this disease? Are you are you bonding in biofilm central? Uh, they look at me like I'm from Mars. I said, let's have a conversation. Let's go outside. You better understand biofilm like Larry Clark and Pulp Dent, and you better understand injection overmolding like Dave Clark and BioClear and understand how to restore teeth the modern way versus doing tension joints. And these are slot preps that we've been doing for decades and get into compression joints that surround the teeth with hydroxyapatite that protect the teeth so they don't break down. But first you get you have, you control the biofilm and then you blast, get the biofilm off the teeth, you blast it off, and then you can actually get into some uh, a really good um, substrates like hydroxyapatite, things like that. So answer your question, absolutely. Um, materials are probably the last thing for me. It's the environment that you work in is probably more important than the materials that you're using. So so rant some more about that litmus paper. Where are you, where are you buying this litmus paper? Is this at a dental supply house? Is this from a chemistry shop? Walmart online. 
Cheap. <laughs> <laughs> love it. Okay. All right. Let's let's give some corporate love here, Howard. GC America is the first one that hey, came hang up. Hang on one that. second. Uh, the Walton family is calling me on line three to thank me okay. for increasing their sales of Walmart online limits. So tell, tell them I'll call them back, Ryan. So, so Walmart online, you buy litmus paper. Yeah, but here's where it came from, Howard. You got to know the history on this. This came from GC America, and minimally invasive dentistry came from Graham Millicich, Tim Rainey, things like this. Now it's echoed by by uh, Brian Novi across our country. He's the bug man. Okay, um, so Brian Novi, N O V Y. He is the man. N O V Y. Brian Novi. Yeah. Is he a dentist? Yeah. So he knows more about biofilm than anybody else around this in this country. Is he your buddy? He's my buddy. Tell him this is the question I want you to ask him. Email him, tell him to come on the show. I got I got the best question the world ever asked of me by hygienists. You know what it was? What? They taught me for four years of school, I'm supposed to scrape all the tartar away. She goes, but in all my patients, you know, where do they have the most tartar? Lingual anteriors. Right. Where do they have the least amount of gum disease? Lingual anteriors. She says it doesn't even make sense. I'm supposed to be going crazy to get every spicula tartar off, but where they have the little spicules, they have the gum disease, and where they have the big buildup, there's no gum disease. That, that, that's a great question. How would well, you answer that question? Well, that's because they're buffering, Howard. When you have your submandibular glands down there, sublingual glands, and you have high kelp producers, they're buffering. Their saliva pH is probably very alkaline. Okay, uh, that's the deal is that GC America say, sells a saliva check. They do the whole saliva thing. You can go uh, have a lunch and learn. They, you can go online. You can do the PDF. You can read it. But after you get, uh, get up and running, then you can buy your own litmus paper and um, uh, just check them in the mouth. The hell, it costs you about five cents and takes you five seconds to determine risk. And what, what, what pH are you looking for? What are you finding? What, what's good? What's bad on that? You and I as humans are neutral pH. We're 7.0 to 7.2. Your resting saliva is 7.0 to 7.2. Ergo, you get into high kelp producers, you're going to be buffering. There's a lot of calcium flying around and put positive on teeth. These are alkaline people. These can be high on the alkaline scale. But if you get into... People with interproximal decay, especially lower mandibulars, Howard, these are acidic, acidic uh, ecosystems. Their, their acidity, heck, they can go down into the fives, anything like this, and then they're feeding themselves uh, sport drinks, which is highly acidic. Bottled water could be almost acidic. Um, you're actually creating the perfect storm, and you have to re-educate these people and remineralize remineralize them with uh, uh, ionic exchange, uh, these calcium pastes and things like this. So it, Kim, Kim Cooch talks about that too. Yeah, yeah, he was there, absolutely. Interesting. Um, yeah, so we, I definitely think dentistry needs to move. I think we were great mechanical engineers in the past, but we need to become biologists. Yes, sir, we do. Howard. That is brilliant because they have to be able to communicate this with their patients. I get so much respect, so many referrals based on my ability to diagnose before I prep. So, so then 41, year, 41 years from there, I, I want to tell you this. Where do you think this profession is going? Um, because remember, we, 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 we got out of school. We saw the orthodontic centers of America on the New York Stock Exchange and does on NASDAQ. They all imploded. They went away 10 years. Now they're all back. They're about 12% of the dentistry is done by chains that have more than 50 locations. But humans are linear thinkers. They think, well, if I bought a house for 100000 and it doubled to 200000 it's going to double to 400000 So buy now. Then they experience their first real estate bubble uh, uh, crash. Do you think, where, where, where do you think dentistry will be in 20 years? Do you, do you think corporate will take over? Do you think it'll plateau? Do you think it'll contract? Will we all be working at McDental's? In, if some girl just walked out of dental school day and she said to you, this is the question. Frank, in 41 years, will I be working at McDonald's? I think the trend line is, un, is unquestioned at this point. You have 
a political economic situation, Howard. You have the dental schools who are taking money from corporates to come in there and get them into corporate structures, okay? These young graduates don't know any better. They want money, they want cash flow to service the debt. They don't know what we know in private practice. I'm not knocking it. I understand why it's there and what they do. But the politicians, as you've seen with the Affordable Health Care Act, and we saw with Hillary Clinton in the 90s, they're drooling to get dentistry on board and get this into the same container as medicine. And if you get that kind of a behavior, quality care is out the door. So I'd say be wary. Keep your antennas up. Be, stay alert. Don't surrender your sword to politicians. Don't surrender your swords to corporates. Keep private practice alive. And the, the gap is widening now between corporates and private practice. It's getting harder to sell these practices, Howard. You know this. These young kids, are, are they, they have no, no uh, equity. They can't buy these expensive boutique practices. They're going someplace where it's simple and they can make some money. So there will always be a need for the practices that offer solutions, biofilm, smart materials, therapeutic materials, scanners, all the things to fix things and prevent things. There's always going to be a market for those individuals that want to thrive there. But I think that number is, is um, going to decrease in the future. I want to ask want you to ask another uh, politically incorrect macroeconomic question. Um, some of these kids are wondering, um, maybe I'll go into the Air Force to help pay off some of these student loans. Uh, what, what's, what's dentistry like in the Air Force, the Army, the Navy, and of course the Navy dentists are the ones that do the Marines, but um, you're, you're familiar, you, you've actually uh, taught uh, Air Force. Well, what is dentistry like in the Armed Forces? Because okay. I believe to this day, the largest employer of dentists in the entire world is the uh, Chinese military. The second is the India, Indian, um, India's military. And third is the United States Pentagon. So the largest employers of dentistry to this day is actually not corporate, it's the military. What's dentistry like in the military today? Okay, great question, Howard. And if we wrap up this uh, discussion. No, I'll, I'll go I, 40 days and 40 nights with you. Okay. You're, not, you're not gonna get out of here on a timer. You're gonna, you're gonna okay. have to. Uh, Here's, remember those doors that opened up for me? Yeah. Uh, military opened up for me. I'm going to thank Dan Fisher from Alterdent. Back in the 90s, I had heard that they do military seminars. I'm a very patriotic guy. And I saw my buddies going to Vietnam. I saw them come back. I saw some of them that didn't come back. I saw some of them that came back messed up. And um, I saw what our country how they didn't acknowledge these people in a positive way when they came back. It was disgraceful. And I just said, I have to do something. I was curious about the military, kind of physical guy myself. And um, I sought out Dan Fisher and I said, okay, if you get an opening, I wanna go. And he introduced me to Pete Lund, who did all the military seminars. And I said, hey, I'm your guy. If you need somebody, let's go. Let's do this thing. So we started doing the military seminars, Howard, and you, either you are a um, uh, AGD resident can go into the uh, armed forces. Uh, Uncle Sam's going to pay for your your dental tuition. You know, how much is that, Howard? That's like major money. And in turn, you give Uncle Sam, you put on a uniform and you give Uncle Sam three to four years. Okay. Army, Navy, Air Force, uh, Coast Guard, public health. Now, my experience in the military is, is extraordinary. It opened up so many doors for me, Howard. First of all, I got to see the commanding officers that sacrificed 20 plus years, taking their families around the world, um, moving them around to schools, new housing, they didn't live up, up, up lavishly, they sacrificed. I got to meet those men, and I got to meet the new graduates, the AGD graduates, the residents, and people on their 
journey. And what they got was competency. They got oversight. You cannot evolve as a military dentist unless you are competent because they can't take men and women off the front line in any of these places because a filling falls out, especially the Air Force. So I've been to most bases around the country teaching. I've been fortunate to teach over in Tokyo for the Tri-Service Elite. These are the best men and women in all three, all branches of the military, including the Japanese, okay? I've done seminars on aircraft carriers. I've been where the Marines are. I've been in Okinawa. Um, I've been to Pendleton. I've been to Lejeune. I've been to Fort Bragg. I see the men who serve, and then I see the dental personnel as well. So when you go into the military, first of all, you have to have a direct style of talking like you and me. No, no, no candy coating. They want the direct thing. They want it. Now, when you are done, if they like you, they give you a coin like this one. I got a whole stack of these, Howard, from all branches. That's a sign of respect. You know what that's worth? That's priceless. Worth, that's priceless. When you go into Pendleton, you get a Navy SEAL hat. What's that worth? Priceless. That's priceless. When you go into Fort Jackson and the commanding officer gives you a black colonel's beret because they liked you, what's that worth, Howard? Priceless. priceless. Answer your question. You put on a, if you ever so cons desire to put on a uniform, go do it. It's the best thing you can do. When you come out of that military, Air Force, Navy, Army, you go in the short stack of the applications when, when docs are looking for an associate or a partner, that anybody with a military background is in that short stack because I know what, who these people are. They're disciplined. They know how to take orders. They are qualified people, Howard. They're mature. They see a different view of the world. And I may say is that I'll be 68 years old this year twice. I've been called out on military bases in push-up contests to go against 27-year-old lieutenants. I go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. I've done this twice. I've been set up, and they bring in their hot shots. We go toe-to-toe -to -toe for one minute with a stopwatch. I'm 2-0. and Not, How many can you do in a minute? Uh, back then, I was doing probably 75. Damn, I, I don't even know if I could eat 75 french fries in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, I salute the military. I think it's a no-brainer. Same with public health. I want, I want to ask you another tough question. I, you know, I call it dentistry uncensored. It's politically incorrect because, like I say, my, my homies just want to hear the God-honest truth from a guy that has uh, the balls to say it. Um, again, she wants to be a good dentist. And... Um, you're living up there in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, uh, 3M's in, Minnesota, in uh, Minneapolis. But um, right now, she's um, just takes a $17 Impergum impression made by 3M, and she sends it to a lab. And a lot of people are telling her she needs to buy, she needs to upgrade from a $17 Impergum impression uh, to a $17,000 TrueDef scanner. That if she really wants to be a good dentist, she's got to be a good scanner. And they keep saying things. Well, you know, when you send a, an Impergum impression to lab or a polyvinyl salox saying there's about a 5 or 6% remake, but when we get these uh, oral scans, we only have a 1% remake. And she's like, God, that's a lot of money. What would you tell her? Is it worth seventeen grand to go from a $17 3M Impergum to a $17,000 TrueDef scanner? I wouldn't, start your, I wouldn't start your journey there, Howard, because I'm old school. I think you got to have, have to do it manually. You have to do a good job manually, know all the pitfalls, control all the parameters that build a successful impression. You have to know the tray selection. You have to know adhesion. You have to know what generation grafted surfactants. What are you using on this? Because you and I came from rubber base. You and I came <laughs> from uh, hydrocolloid. Right. Okay? We're talking a long time ago. I tell them today straight up, 
I'd say, I want to see your impressions first and see what kind of quality you're feeding into the laboratory, putting your signature on a lab form, putting it in a box and let somebody pour it up like I did in the dental laboratories. And only if you can qualify or somebody's vetting you to get into scanning, then I would say it just because you got a scanner, Howard, doesn't mean you're going to get the detail you want. If you're not giving the scanner good information, it's the same thing as a polyvinyl. What the heck? You got to know what to look for first. Technology is not going to overrun, overrule quality. It can't. And that's the difference between dentistry and physicians. You oh, when five dentists are sitting at lunch, they're all bragging about their 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 high tech toys. You never hear physicians. You never hear dermatologists and family physicians talking about all this high end equipment. I mean, you, you just don't. It's almost like a lot of this stuff in dentistry. Almost you go. I want to ask you one question. You, you we went over. Uh, we're in a minute overtime. Can I keep you for one, an overtime question? Yeah. Um, why do you think corporate medicine is so different than corporate dentistry? You, you're up there in uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul. Um, you're right an hour away from Rochester where, I mean, in medicine, when these guys want to get big, they do like Mayo Clinic, quality, 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 or Cleveland Clinic, or Sloan Kettering, or Scripps in San Diego. It seem, seems like when a dentist when the physicians want to open up a bed clinic, they just go for Mercedes Benz and people. How far away do people fly from to go to Rock to go to Mayo Clinic up the street from you in Rochester? Because they just know if they go there, it's going to be someone like Frank Milner who's just going to do it the best possible way, not what the insurance company Medicaid Medicare plays. But when you look at the the fifty, the thirty five corporate chains in America that have fifty or more locations. Um, it's always something faster, easier, cheaper. No one's, no one's gone after, no corporate dental chain's gone after a deal like, we just want to be the best. We wanted, we wanted to create a dental office where our grandchildren and great-grandchildren would go after we were dead. Why do you see the, the difference there? Okay, there's a huge difference. My father was a physician, and that's why I'm a dentist, because he was never home. But he was the old guard. He rode the golden age of medicine by making house calls. He did all, he had to go uh, work grueling days and then do admits, discharges, things like this. He says, don't do this. He said, I, he was the old fashioned guy that paid attention to all the details and they had no personal life. Now, you can see in medicine, we got good docs in that are owned by the insurance companies in Minnesota, no different than a lot of places. They're all owned by big conglomerate insurance companies. They're still good docs, Howard. But what's on that keyboard? What's in that software that tells them what you can have and what you can't have? What is available and what is not available? Now, you can't diagnose anymore. You're not a, the true physician that you were educated in, de in medical school. Now bring up the Mayo Clinic down there. They're salaried. They're not on production. They're on outcomes. And they're one phone away from just picking up the phone, calling Howard, talking to Frank about diabetes, about neuropathy, about cancer. They find solutions down there and they have departments that Talk about your case, Howard, if you have a complicated, rare case. They talk about it and find the best doctor for you to meet your need to get the best possible solution. My fear is when you go look at the medical doctors that are keyboarding or they have a scribe, a physician's assistant doing that, is that they have so much time because they are booked so much differently than at the Mayo Clinic. I don't know if that answered your question. It, it did. But it's kind of sad because once all the physicians are employees of the insurance companies, where do the patients go when they need a doctor? Don't know, Howard. It, it uh, You got to ask yourself the question. That, as you know, you saw the medical students when we were dental students, and the old rub was, if you weren't smart enough to get in the medical school, you became a dentist. Well, I wasn't kind of hurt. Okay, I took that personally. Well, it was actually true, but I took it personal. Now, why are there more applications for dental school than there are medical school today? 
Because once you get in bed with anybody, you're going to get screwed. And in 1962, when the physicians got in bed with the government for John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson's uh, Medicaid and Medicare, once they got in bed, it sounded like a hot date and a one-night stand, but once they got in bed together, um, you know, it's it's going to be different. <laughs> so you and I, as we wrap up our a lively discussion, no holds barred, bare knuckles. Okay, that's what you and I are. We're we're the last guard here, coming through a different era of dentistry where we stood up uh, straight to our bench instructor. They they could ruin us, and they could do anything they wanted to us, and we we took it. But we're in the world's best profession right now. And I don't want anybody to give it away. We've invested too much time. We've had too much, um, too much of our own investment from the past, from GV Black, so on and so forth. All our bench instructors, all our clinical educators, all the publishers, all the people who stand in front of you and we can't give it away because we'll bastardize dentistry. And then what's left will only be fading memories uh, in the in the history books about what you and I used to do. Well, we will not let that happen. <laughs> and one of the ways we will not let that happen is because I'm able to get amazing dentists like you to come on the show and talk to these young kids on their smartphone while they're commuting. You know, they have an hour commute to work and. Frank, seriously, thank you so much for spending an hour of your life with me today talking to my homies. Oh, Howard, I've won the lottery, and it took me a while to figure out what this thing was all about, but I got it. And now when I'm coming down, coming into the, the back nine of, uh, of the golf course, I don't see the clubhouse yet, but I want to give <laughs> away as much as I can to anybody who will listen and teach it in an ethical, practical manner. Well, and give give some of that away on uh, Dental Town Magazine. It's uh, it's amazing. Um, it goes to 125,000 general dentists, but it but it's sent digitally and emailed to dentists all over the world. So uh, maybe, maybe someday maybe. you'll grace us with an article on Dental Town Magazine, which is really digital. Really, it's print and digital, or even better, an online CE course. That would be epic to have one from the man. Howard, let's do a pink composite uh, online course. Oh, man, you do that. It'll be my birthday every day. All right. All right. Again, thanks so much for coming on the show. And uh, tell your lovely, adorable wife I said hello. God bless, Howard. All right. Same to you, buddy.